It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, dig into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is my friend Lucas Miles, and we're going to be talking about his brand new book, Woke Jesus, The False Messiah Destroying Christianity. Lucas, it is always a joy to see you, my friend. Welcome back to the show. Sean, thanks for having me. Uh, Likewise, always a pleasure. Well, Lucas, first things first, uh, I know there are new people who are going to be meeting you for the first time on our talk today. Let's go back to that age-old question. I probably had you answer three or four times at this point on the show. Uh, Give us a little bit of the Lucas Miles origin story. For somebody meeting you for the first time, give them a little bit of context for you and your ministry. Yeah, no, for sure. I appreciate that and uh, always good to connect with new folks. So um, I'm a pastor. I I started preaching uh, at about 17 years old, so really had a call fairly early on in ministry. And uh, God kind of gave me a radical call in life. And um, my wife and I, we got married. I was 21 when we got married. Uh, We planted a church after uh, um, some time doing some uh, ministry training. I was a philosophy religious major uh, in college at uh, uh, started Purdue and finished at IU. So kind of got a split home over that uh, and uh, ended up planting a church at about 24 years old. And I am still pastoring that same church today um, at uh, 43. I'll be 44 this year. So going on um, going on 20 years um, as a senior pastor here in the same location, which I think in today's world is fairly rare. Um, and, you know, during that time, God's just, you know, continue just to give us more and more of a platform. I put out a book in 2016 called Good God, the one we want to believe in, but are afraid to embrace. Um, and that uh, that that launched afterwards, my podcast show called The Lucas Miles Show. We've done, I don't know, 150 uh, so episodes on that uh, and then ended up uh, putting out a second book called The Christian Left uh, that came out in 2021. And that book is probably the thing that a lot of people first discovered me, uh, you know, from. Uh, I was endorsed by Mike Huckabee on the cover. And and uh, it's, you know, it's not necessarily, I'm not positioning my new book, Woke Jesus, as a sequel to that. But in some ways, it kind of is. It, it's it, it's an iteration of thought. And uh, so with The Christian Left, I mean, it 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 really took off and, and developed a life of its own. Um, and we had anticipation. We felt like that book was going to do well. I was certainly very proud of it and still am. Um, but uh, it, I think it did even better than we expected. I, I did probably... I think we the final number was somewhere around 225 to 250 interviews in about an 18 month period. Um, I mean, we just were blitzing through radio, TV, you know, all you podcasts, you name it, um, and was all over the country, you know, speaking in churches. And and the cool thing about that book was I was in churches of virtually every denomination. I mean, I spoke at Catholic events, I spoke at uh, uh, Protestant events, Baptist churches, Charismatic churches, Presbyterian churches. You know, normally there's a kind of a theological bubble as a pastor that you really don't go outside of that very often. But that book crossed barriers and um, ended up launching a TV show with Epoch Times afterwards uh, called Church and State. We just finished season one, which I can announce this now because it just broke. Um, That show won a program of the year at the National Religious Broadcaster. So very, very excited about that. Uh, And so we're we're excited to kind of look at season two, what that uh, might hold. Um, And uh, we have this new book here, of course, Woke Jesus, uh, The False Messiah Destroying Christianity. And it's been uh, it's been about a year year and a half um, getting this out the door and and uh, very excited to bring this to market. I think it's timely and and uh, I think it's something that is a, a really critical battle facing the church today. So although I'm proud of the book and excited about it, uh, I, I also take very serious the content and how important the message is. And I think we're in kind of a, a respite period in terms of we're kind of two-ish years out for maybe a little less from the next presidential election. And so in terms of pushback, censorship, I feel like that's calmed. I think we'll see it tick up as we get closer to the next election. So some of the the conversations, they're they're not so loud right now. Um, uh, But in terms of like woke Christianity, we'll we'll see more of this tick up again, I think, as as the months go by. But for somebody who's like, I didn't even know that Christianity and wokeness could somehow come together and have a baby. What, What is that for the person who's like, has no clue what we're talking about? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, and I think you're right. There is there is a little bit of a respite, but it's not completely a respite. I think what's happening is a lot of development more behind the scenes. And, and honestly, this is a perfect time for Christians to kind of prepare themselves. There's an intro before I kind of get to that question. I think the importance of this, um, you know, when you look at Israel's history, specifically in the life of Hezekiah during the book of Isaiah, um, you know, the Assyrians were such a dominant force. But there was a time of about 40 years where the Assyrians kind of backed off from their their uh, uh, conquest and it gave Israel a chance to 
uh, fortify their defenses and really, de- you know, redevelop their their uh, and strengthen their religious structure and 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 uh, um, you know uh, legal structure of their nation. And I think we have a little window of that right now. That that the job of the church right now is to to strengthen our hearts, to prepare ourselves, to educate ourselves on these topics because there's getting ready to be, I believe, the fight of our life against this thing called wokeness. And you know, we can talk about critical theory, socialism. You know, they're all interconnected in this way. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, progressive Christianity or woke Christianity, um, you could call it the Christian left, as I did in my last book. You might also hear it called conscious Christianity. Um, you know, all of these things are really sort of iterations of the same uh, um, the same ideology. And that is, uh, I call it modifiers, that there has been a modifier that's been added to Christianity that's distorted it uh, and really turned it into something that you know, essentially can no longer be called Christian. And in in most cases, that modifier here is is what's known as critical theory or some sort of Marxist thought. And so, in in the Catholic Church, that originally happened in the form of what's known as liberation theology in the 1950s. Uh, we saw that take place in the in the African American Church in America through Black liberation theology. It was literally sort of an adoption of a Marxist viewpoint along with some Christian ideology and theology. Um, and today, we're seeing that with with sort of a, a new fervor and a new um, uh, a sort of radicalization that's taking place with this everything from critical theory to critical queer theory that's being assimilated into Christianity. In fact, I have this, uh, um, I'm, I'm doing an interview this afternoon on local radio here in uh, in my market. And one of the stories that uh, that was sent to me was the University of Notre Dame, which is basically in my backyard here. Um, they are doing an event uh, as a Catholic school founded on training up clergy and new priests in the ministry in the 1800s, they're doing an event called Queer Holiness, an Experiential Christian Anthropology. So it's not just that they have an LGBT event. That would be one thing. And I'm not here to necessarily micromanage everybody's you know, uh, um, uh, morality. I do think that we have to legislate um, morality to a, to a strong degree. But there are, there are certain things that if somebody's not a believer, I don't necessarily have to have an opinion about everybody's life. But when all of a sudden you add the word Christian to this, that we're saying that this is a queer holiness event focused on Christian anthropology, now we're distorting the faith. And that, as a believer, I believe that we have to speak up. So, uh, um, uh, you know, progressive Christianity or woke Christianity, it is Christianity that has adopted these, these modifiers like Marxism or the LGBT movement, and it has a diminished view of the Word of God. Uh, it, it tends to um, really ignore church history, you know, any sort of, you know, church authority uh, tends to lean towards more of a universal, uh, universalist framework, um, you know, not much of an emphasis on sin or heaven and hell uh, or personal salvation. Uh, and it really sees Jesus more as the great, you know, social uh, justice warrior rather than the savior of the world. And uh, they they equate uh, sort of Jesus's uh, um, you know, mission on earth to being this push against systemic oppression. Uh, and it sounds good at times on paper, but when you start digging into it, what you see is this completely counter to the Word of God. Well, as if what we've talked about already didn't have a bunch of controversial buzzwords that can get us all canceled on all the places <laughs> online. Uh, Luke, I'd love to have you comment briefly on Christian nationalism. You, yeah. you, you, you see this come up a lot in the news. You're going to see it come up a lot in the months ahead. Uh, I, I feel like nobody has a consistent definition of what they mean by that. If I talk about it and somebody who would be a lot, a lot more uh, left leaning, say, than me, homeschooling father of 10, uh, it, you know, we would define that very differently. Or if we use that phrase, we mean something very different. So uh, I, I guess from two sides, if we're talking about this in more conservative circles, what do we mean by this? And if we're yeah. hearing it come from more liberal left circles, what completely opposite idea do they have about Christian nationalism? Yeah, so I, I think to, to understand Christian nationalism, there's a couple components. So to begin with, um, let's address kind of the left's you know view of this or the media's view of this. And and that is, I think that the term is being used as what I would call a dog whistle. Uh, it, you know, when you think about nationalist or nationalism, uh, most people go towards Nazism. They, there's a connection between Christian nationalism and Nazism, I think, in a lot of people's minds. And the media knows that, the left knows that, and the left knows that unless they divide the church, they can't win elections. And so they had to create sort of a uh, a conversation that would start driving a wedge between um, Christians to really separate them 
over these issues because in the past, although Christians might have had some different theological viewpoints, traditionally, most Christians have been anti-abortion. They've been pro-life. And so elections became a fairly easy thing for them to agree upon overall. Well, now the left has entered kind of these other, you know, caveats that they're trying to, you know, sub further subdivide um, Christianity. And again, that's that Marxist push is that it's all about, you know, really creating division, you know, oppressor versus oppressed framework. So the left has utilized this term Christian nationalist. And basically, there's a writer named Andrew Whitehead, who he wrote about this. And and he essentially identifies that anybody is a Christian nationalist if they voted for Trump. Uh, these are specific examples he gives. If they voted for Trump, if they believe in the return of Jesus, uh, if uh, he said a lot of times it's it's people that are like soccer moms. He references that weirdly, kind of a strange one. Um, and, uh, you know, they hold kind of these these uh, uh, really kind of more standard. They, they, uh, they believe in um, uh, evangelism. They believe in, you know, what he would call proselytizing their faith. And and so, you know, when you look at this, like that's almost like every Christian, you know, I mean, that that at least every serious evangelical Christian, they probably voted for Trump over Hillary. They believe in the return of Jesus. They believe in, you know, evangelism uh, and they, they you know, say the Pledge of Allegiance like that. And so he's saying that makes somebody a Christian nationalist. Now, according to that definition, every evangelical Christian is a Christian nationalist. And so if that is the definition, oh, you know, I, I understand why certain Christians are, you know, Kind of going, okay, if that's the definition, then yes, I'm a Christian nationalist. I would push back on that a little bit, though. I don't believe that the answer for us is, as uh, evangelical Christians, um, uh, and I, I referenced Notre Dame and Catholicism earlier, just to be clear, I'm a, I'm a, a pastor of a, of a, a non-denominational uh, a church here and very Bible-centric and Jesus-focused. Um, and uh, But, you know, I, don't, I think it's a mistake for Christians to gravitate to, to this term Christian nationalism and to, to adopt it. When you look at, you know, um, Nazi Germany specifically, if that's what the left is trying to do, is trying to earmark evangelicals and equate us with being Nazis, let's talk about that. In Nazi Germany, there was a group of, there was really two main churches. There was the professing church, which is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer was part of, and, uh, you know, individuals, uh, you know, some of the other major theologians at that time, Karl Barth, et cetera. And then you have um, uh, the, the the other half of the church at that time was known as uh, they they preached a gospel that they called positivist Christentum, uh, basically positive Christianity, and they held to a uh, um, a view of the faith that sort of again it got modified by the tenets of the Third Reich or of Nazism in order to really morph into something that was that was not inherently Christian by itself. So they they you know as Metaxas points out they they kind of replaced the the Bible with Mein Kampf and the the cross with the swastika and they held an allegiance to the Nazi state. So when you look at the professing church in Nazi Germany, they weren't the Christian nationalists. It was actually the church that vacated their position uh, um, of holding that the word of God was inerrant or authoritative in their life. And they moved away from that, and they ended up embracing the agenda of the state and mixing that in with their theology. So today, my argument is that if you want to know who what a Christian nationalist looks like, it's actually, I mean, you know, uh, uh, Warnock is a better picture of a Christian nationalist, I believe, than, you know, Franklin Graham. Why? Because Franklin Graham is still willing to speak out. You know, our evangelical leaders are still willing to speak out when they see a politician, even if they're a conservative politician, do something that they believe is against God. But what we see on the left is we see there's no difference between the progressive church, the woke church, and the leftist state in their view of abortion, in their view of gender and sexuality, in their view of socialism, in their view of, you know, any given topic, family, marriage, et cetera. And so the leftist state has... Uh, um, has won over the leftist church, and the leftist church is bowing their knee to the state. And I would call that, based upon you know uh, uh, this sort of um, uh, model that we have in Nazi Germany, I would call that Christian nationalism. So I think as evangelicals, we don't need any moniker other than disciple, believer, Christian, Jesus follower, and those are good enough for me. It's what was good enough for for the disciples and in, in, in the early church. And so I think it's a trap to try to... Um, you know, to try to embrace this term Christian nationalist, even though they're trying to skew the definition to include every single evangelical. Yeah, I think uh, your definition pretty much encompasses literally every single person I know from church, authors yeah. I work with. We all kind of would fall under yep. that umbrella. Um, I'm not saying I'm going to make this t-shirt for my merch store, but maybe 
I'm the Christian nationalist they warned you about or something. That would be something <laughs> kind of at least interesting to see how people responded when you were that yeah. out to, uh, yeah, to the and, store. And, you, know, and you see guys <laughs> and I, I uh, you know, I, I know him a little bit. He's been on my podcast show and I've certainly uh, valued his work. Guys like Charlie, Charlie Kirk and, you know, some other you know thought leaders have, have been a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, 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 maybe bolder in embracing a turn. They're kind of go, okay, if you're going to call us Christian nationalists, then okay, so be it. Um, and I get the philosophy there. I just think that that it's this is a it's a better argument to reverse this on the left and say, look, if you want to know what a Christian nationalist is, it's somebody who lets go of their faith in order to worship the state, and that's exactly what is happening on the left right now. Yeah, I get the sentiment of trying to own it or make fun of it and having fun with it, but it's it's a distraction, it's a trap. So be, be careful. 100%. Be careful yeah. what you embrace. Uh, one of the things that I think is is just a big challenge for the age we're in culturally is people have no sense of belonging. You've been told your your family of origin is evil. In fact, yeah. your country's evil. Christianity's evil. So people have absolutely no story to write themselves into or no place that they really can feel like they belong. And so I was intrigued that you talk about that, even though we often equate the left as being godless and without morals. What's godless actually is a progressive form of religious devotion. And so that, that just intrigues me because I've been talking about this for the last few years that people are listless, they're lost, they're looking for a place to belong, be yeah. discipled, have importance, make a difference. And so uh, they just need something religious to devote their faith to. Is, is what we're seeing on the left actually a form of religious devotion? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, you know, you mentioned this, the, the left used to be kind of this godless party. And in fact, I think there was, you know, you know, a couple terms ago, there was sort of they, they, the big statement of they're taking God out of the Democratic Party platform and sort of everybody, you know, stand, stood up to sort of renounce God at their uh, at their party meeting. And, and I don't think it's that way anymore. I think the left, because they've realized, as I said earlier, they can't win an election without um, separating, and dividing the church. I think they've started embracing a lot more religious language. And I think it's important to recognize that although the left's morals are different than what we would say, you know, line up with the biblical moral or even with absolute truth or what we could even call as natural law, um, the left still has developed sort of a distorted moral of their own. So they have a moral code. Um, that moral code says that it's actually um, righteous for a uh, for a priest or a teacher to help a student hide from their parents their questions about sexuality and gender. Um, their moral law would say that it is actually uh, it, it is actually um, uh, um, vile to try to prevent two people who love each other, regardless of their, you know, age, sexual, you know, uh, uh, persuasion or whatever to to marry um, that it would be it would be, a, 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 you know, an atrocity to get in the way of that. So it, it's really worth seeing kind of what the Bible talks about, about, you know, calling good evil and evil good and the more but the, the, i think the important thing to realize is that this is a moral it is a morality for the left it's a distorted evil morality but it is a morality and they hold to it with a religious you know fundamentalism they have a uh they're they're very staunch on these things there is a code that they're following it's not that they're just uh, um yeah, i think trying to you know uh be pagan or be godless although we could certainly classify it as such that there is a a systematic approach to what they're doing um, and a devotion to it, and you know I always say that you know that the, the they kind of have their trinities of them their own is that you know the left um, their their uh, um, their place of worship is the environment, uh, their method of worship is sexuality, and their their object of worship is the state. You know, and there's a religious devotion to that that exists. And I think as Christians, we have to understand that and we have to re recognize that we're not just fighting against um, uh, ideologies of people that don't know the Lord. We're, we're battling against people who have embraced really a, a pagan, um, uh, uh, you know, an uh, idolatrous worldview. And it has become a religion to them just as strong as the religion of maybe somebody who worshiped Baal in the Old Testament. And and that is, I think, a better example of what we were up against rather than just a lost generation. Yeah, I think of the amount of people, it, just even in my circles, where especially I feel like it, it shifted with folks that are a little bit younger. I mean, I'm 45. But I think of the generations that came after me in terms of being conditioned to just be triggered if you ask a hard question about this social issue or that social issue. Right. Uh, it is it is amazing to if you start asking like what what uh, what how did that progress when you were growing up? Because I think. Um, when I was growing up, it was being politically correct, and then it shifted to being socially aware, and the language yeah. changed, but the 
the things you were indoctrinated with, uh, with the folks, the gen- two generations after me, a lot more hardcore than what I saw yeah. growing up uh, yeah. in the Gen X generation. Uh, I think, Lucas, the place I'd love to land the interview is um, just have you talk about kind of like what can a practically or what can a biblically minded Christian practically do? Because I, I feel like people, they, they, they see, OK, we're being attacked on all fronts, culture, media, everywhere. And it just kind of feels like death and destruction by a thousand cuts. What yeah. what can the average Christian do? So they, they they read your book, they get informed. How can they push back? How can they make a difference right now yeah. and impact culture? Yeah, yeah so I, I start in the introduction to the book. Actually, I, I give an example of um, the uh, the church early church father Irenaeus, and he wrote a book called Against Heresies. It's like this thick, 600 pages. And the book was specifically to educate the church on Gnosticism. And in some ways, I feel like that's what this book, Woke Jesus, is, is I'm trying to educate the church on wokeism to equip them to be able to deal with it. Irenaeus argued really at the start of his book that the reason why the first century church was not able to put the nail in the coffin on on Gnosticism was because they did not understand it fully. And so he was writing to the second century church trying to empower them. And I think that we have lost these battles. I mean, the church is still wrapping up their mind, like, you know, trying to figure out how to respond to say um, uh, uh, somebody who's pro-abortion or or uh, pro-gay marriage, but the world has gone past that so fast. Now we have you know children that are using litter boxes and th- and, and are furries. We have you know uh, um, we have you know people that are 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 talking about you know uh, being maps minor attracted persons. You know we're moving into all the of course the entire you know uh, gender trying to trans you know debate and everything else that's happening. The world is not waiting for the church to get answers on how to address these moral issues. The church has to speed up, catch up, and ultimately get ahead so that we can, you know, effectively communicate the gospel in, 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 uh, uh, you know, with, with power and truth um, to these issues and to people that we encounter as we go. And so uh, I think on a practical level, one of the things that I've done is, you know, in addition to, to writing this book and touring with the book and speaking and everything else, We've, we've launched an initiative called the AmericanPastorProject.org. So it's AmericanPastorProject.org. And we are asking pastors of all denominations, there's a high-level doctrinal statement that they can find on the website, and we're asking them to join with us in signing that doctrinal statement. And it has a commitment to uh, Christian orthodoxy, kind of in line with the, Nic- uh, the Nicene Creed or Apostles' Creed. And, and then it also has with it a commitment to not use your pulpit to promote wokeism, um, LGBT, globalism, uh, um, socialism, you know, all these different things, and that you're going to reject those I- those ideologies from the pulpit. And so we are seeing pastors from all different denominations sign up for that. And there's actually a church locator that we're building right now where you can have your church listed there. And maybe if you're in a market and you don't have a pastor, you don't have a church yet that, that you found that's not, you know, that's not woke because so many churches that are, uh, you can go there and you can look up a church near you in various denominations and you could find that. And so uh, that's something we're building right now. It, the website's live. Uh, we're, we're picking up a lot of steam with that. We have some great partnerships that, have, that are, are, are really taking place with some larger denominations. And there's also some strong nonprofits that are helping us get the word out. But that would be probably something very practically that both, you know, lay leaders as well as pastors can go and sign up for and, 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 and really, you know, find out more about. And Lucas, in terms of the listeners and viewers connecting with you, finding out more about this book, yeah. your other resources, where are the places we can discover you? On yeah, the so first off, I got a copy of the book here. So it's Woke Jesus, uh, The False Messiah Destroying Christianity. It's available through Humanix, which is Newsmax's publishing arms. So if you're a fan of Newsmax, you're probably going to like the book. Uh, and uh, it's a, it's available wherever books are sold, Barnes & Noble, of course, Amazon, Books a Million, et cetera. Uh, if you want to find out more about me or, you know, uh, you know, catch my speaking circuit or maybe consider having me into, uh, you know, your market or your church, uh, you can head over to lucasmiles.org and you can find out more about that and get in touch with us. I'm easy to find on social media as well. Uh, everything from uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, et cetera. And like we do with every episode, we'll make it easy. We'll have links in the description and the show notes to websites mentioned, as well as links to the places you can pick up your very own copy of Lucas's brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Lucas Miles. Once again, our book today was Woke Jesus, The False Messiah Destroying Christianity. And Lucas, I want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's always an honor and a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thank you.